You know, a couple weeks ago, I kicked off a new series of messages called fruitfulness, and it's, it's a description of what takes place when you connect with God. Oftentimes, we're, we're busy thinking about this God and thinking about ourselves, and the, the two don't connect, but then Jesus comes along with this illustration that's my favorite when it comes to describing how God and man can relate is he uses the description of a vineyard in John chapter 15. And in John 15, he talks about how his father is the gardener, the vine dresser, and says, and he is the vine. And the life comes from the vine. And outside of the vine are these branches. We are the branches. And so what happens is we're born in this world disconnected from the vine. So somehow, some way, there has to be a grafting in. You and I have to be grafted into the vine. But once we're grafted in, then your branch grows. And it's God's will, according to the scripture, that your branch bears fruit. And that fruit is not necessarily like you're used to hearing, like it's not apples and oranges, and, and it's not that. It's more like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. It's called the fruit of the Spirit when there's a connection there. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at more closely these different fruits. And, and two weeks ago, we started with the fruit called joy. It's not the first one that's identified. That's love. And we'll deal with that at another time. But we started with joy, and we asked the question, okay, what is this joy? What does it mean? What does it look like? And, and when, you're trying to, when you're trying to think about joy, I usually immediately jump to those bad times in my life where I've had incredibly hard circumstances, and I ask myself the question, did I really have joy then? And sometimes not, but sometimes yes. So the question is, if, if it's possible to be joyful in the midst of horrible circumstances, I want to know how that works. And that's really where we're going. I want to show you how it works. I want you to, to see that you're experiencing this thing called joy is a matter of choice. It's a decision you and I make on a daily basis. But the question is, how do we choose joy? And that, the answer to that question is found in the book of Philippians, which is where we're going to spend the most of our time t today. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at a place called Philippi. And in it, he, he talks about joy and rejoicing over and over, 16 times in four chapters. He deals with this concept of joy and rejoicing. And so in it, what he's trying to do is help you and I see how do you actually practically apply these lessons so that you can be joyful no matter what the circumstances. Now, there are feelings associated with joyfulness, and you could call those happiness or elation, those kind of things, but they're, they come and they go. And our circumstances are the ones that really move them in or out. But joy stays put. Now, before we jump into Philippians, though, I want to show you these three keys. And this is where we started last uh, two weeks ago. And you'll notice in the worship guide, I've given you the answers for all the points that I've already covered. All right, so you got those. If you, if you kept yours from two weeks ago, you can just kind of continue on. Uh, I've added some more, a couple more points and some of the things. That's the danger of letting me have two more weeks to think about a message. There's always going to be additional points because I can always think of some other things I wanted to be able to share with you that I couldn't because of the time constraints. But understand that we're, I want to I highlight the three keys again because for you to rightly understand how do you apply uh, joy to your life. How do you choose joy? You've got to always keep in mind these three keys. I want you just to imagine a door that has three locks. And unless you unlock all three, the door doesn't open. And you can get one or two of them. The door's not open. You have to unlock all three with the three different keys. And then once the door is open, that frees you to express joy, which is the word rejoice, or to experience joy. So let me kind of start that way. The three keys that unlock the door are, are of joy, called joy is this. Number one, joy is evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. This is so important. Joy is evidence of God in you. L listen to this. Galatians 5, that's the verse I was just referring to a moment ago. Chapter 5, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the what? Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and, and so on. So what's he saying here? He's saying that you don't enter in a relationship with God so that you produce a fruit called joy. He says, no, by allowing the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God to come and take up residency in you enables you to experience joy because he is the producer of joy. That's it. It has nothing to do with the other. So to choose joy, you're not really choosing joy so much as you are choosing God. When you choose the spirit of the living God and invite him to come into your life, you have chosen to live a joyful life in addition to the other fruit. The other fruit will not come 
if the Spirit of God is not living in you. You'll experience some temporal, temporary feelings associated with joy, but there will be nothing permanent or long-lasting unless He resides in you. This is so important. So now understand, we are born into this world with Him not in us, all right? But God says, but that's why I sent Jesus. Jesus stepped out of heaven, became a man in order to die on a cross for our sins. Since he was innocent, he's God, he's perfect. Since he's innocent, he doesn't have to die for his sins. So he could literally become a man and live and be crucified for our sins. He, was, he died. He says he paid the debt at that time. He says it is finished, it's paid in full. And then three days later, after he was buried into a tomb, he rose again and he says, now listen, I'm willing to offer you forgiveness and eternal life. You just need to simply receive me. That's sort of what, that verse that most of you have memorized, John 3, 16, it's the the verse we learn as children, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. So that's the point. So to just know, before we look at how do you choose joy, what, what you're really choosing is to release God's spirit that resides in you, may, loose him so that he can create within you this joy. It's not about getting joy as so much as it is letting him do what he wants to do in your life. And that's a whole other issue in and of itself. The second key is this. Your intimacy with God determines the intensity of your joy. Let me say that again. Your intimacy with God determines the intensity of your joy. Joy will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow as long as you are growing in your relationship with God. That's what this is. Your intimacy factor with God means that you're growing to know him better. It means you're walking with him. It means that you're following his lead. As you grow in that way, then what happens is the intensity of all the fruit flavors, love, joy, peace, patience, and and it just grows to where you you feel like you're going to explode on the inside because he is trying to live through you. So just understand, as we, as we commit ourselves to growing in intimacy with God, you are committing yourselves to letting the fruit literally be born on your branches. And then the third key is your obedience to God opens the floodgates of joy. Your obedience to God does that. I've, I've said this many, many times. The blessings of God are around the corner of obedience. You, there's not a single one of us that doesn't want God to bless us. We want that. Well, what's keeping it from happening? I mean, we cry out to God, where are your blessings? And God is saying, just do what I said. And what's happened is built into the response and the consequences of your obedience are blessings. When it comes to joy, (laughs) that's exactly what he's talking about here. He's saying, we, we need to learn to trust him and do what he says. When we follow his lead, you can expect one of the, the byproducts, the fruit will be fruit will be joy that springs up. And that's what, Je- when Jesus is describing the, the, the vines and the branches in John 15, listen to what he says. Verse five says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And the word abide there means you're resting in, you're totally trusting in, you're li- literally obeying him. That's what that means. So he says, if you Abide in me and I in you, then he bears much fruit. Then you go down to verse 11, and it says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Your joy may be made full. It is God's desire for you to experience joy. So these are the three keys. If we miss these three keys, you can choose joy all you want, and you're going to come up short. And you say, I'm doing it the way you said. I'm I'm following the scripture. And God is saying, yeah, but you forgot that you got to open the door first. You got to make sure you enter into a personal relationship with God because it's God who creates the joy within you. He doesn't send you joy. He is the joy within you, the joy factor. And he says, and as you grow in that relationship with him, you can expect the intensity of that joy to explode within you. But never forget, it's obedience. Bottom line, it's obedience. So now that brings us to the book of Philippians. How do you choose joy? And I want you to highlight some of these first three or four, which we covered already, because I want us to dig in five and further. These are the ones we covered last time. Number one, take time to pray for others. You want joy? Pray for other people and watch what God does inside you. When you pray for others, you begin to see prayers answered, and that creates an incredible joy just to hear about the answers. I heard about an answer just this morning. A lady walked in and said she had been hurting deeply, and she got into the hospital for a different a surgery, a surgical treatment, and she was in incredible pain. And it's just right there, sharp. And she says, and I asked people to pray for me. And she says, and 
the next day I woke up and it was gone. Now, how long is it going to stay? We don't know. So it could stay permanently. It may not. But, she, but she's convinced because she took the initiative and she said, I, I asked people to pray for me. And so she wanted to make sure that somebody heard about the answer. Well, when she told me that, I said, this is great. You need to tell somebody. She said, I'm going to tell my community group this morning. See, that's the kind of way that's, that, that God uses prayer. When we begin to pray for others, that, that's the first point. Number, the second way to choose joy is live in a way that motivates others to talk about Jesus. And this was that passage where Paul was imprisoned. He says, I'm in, I'm in chains, and I, I have the Praetorian Guard, which is the, the elite guard of, of Caesar, guarding him while he's in prison, waiting for some kind of ruling. And, and a guard had to be chained to Paul, so there's no way he could get free. And then when another guard came for another shift, they'd untie that one guard, and they'd attach the chain to the new guard, and on and on. And Paul says, you guys think this is horrible because I can no longer do what I used to do. I can't travel from church to church to church or, or place to place to place and do that, and you're, you're heartbroken because I can't do what I've always done. He says, but don't you get it? Now that I'm chained to these Roman soldiers, they're bringing people in for me to share Jesus with. They can't escape. He says, this is working out better than I'd ever hoped for. And see, they've always associated imprisonment as being a horrible thing. And, and now the people are watching Paul saying, well, maybe it's not so bad. And, and then what he says is, so many, many more people are starting to share Jesus with people having seen my predicament and seen how it's worked out for good. Now, that's when you know that the way you're living your life is benefiting others and helping others to take a step, you're going to feel incredible joy. That's what, that's what he's talking about there. Then number three, how do you choose joy? Choose to be a source of joy to others by investing in their lives directly. God has uniquely made you, given you experiences. There are things that you can do that some, no, a lot of people can't do that you could pour your life into them. There, there are new parents in our church that are wondering, what do I do with this now? They handed me this little thing here at the hospital. I tell them, home, what am I supposed to do? Well, some of you have been there. You've done that. You ought to come alongside some of these parents and say, hey, let me, let me help you with this little guy or this little gal. You're mentoring that way. You're pouring your life into people. You look for ways. I mean, there are people that are just they're starting their new career and, and they're not sure how, exactly how to start right, but they want to do it right. And you've been there, done that. And you can come alongside them and say, well, let me help give you some tips on what to do and what not to do. But when you do that, you know what happens? When somebody else succeeds as a result of your investment, it creates with you this incredible joy. That's how you choose joy. Because it's really not about you. It's about him, and he's all about you. So he says, so our response when we're cooperating with God is simply to begin investing in others. And we spent a lot of time about this two weeks ago, but I just wanted to highlight it. Now, number four, choose to work with and cooperate with others. That's how you choose joy. This is, this is another way to say, choose to act like a team member. The Bible talks about the church, and the church is a body, and, and some parts of the body are arms, and some are legs, and some are ears, and some are noses, and some are tongues, and, and so we all have different roles in the body, and God's point is that when we all act in unity as a body, we're going to get a whole lot more done than if you try to do it all on your own. I mean, ask yourself the question, how in the world is an ear going to be able to speak? It's not going to happen. They were not wired and created to speak. They were created to hear. And if, and if the tongue does all the work, then he's never going to know what the comments are and what the responses are. He's just going to assume certain things. God is saying, listen, there, you can accomplish so much more according to my plans if you work together than you can if you just do it by yourself. I understand it's messy when you do it by yourself. Uh, I mean, when you do it with others. But it's worth it because you're pouring your life into somebody and you're teaching them to be productive and fruitful in their lives. That's how you choose joy. When, when you see that happen and you're seeing people work together as a team, that's what happened to Paul. He says, man, I want to commend you. You have got the one same mind. Verses one and two of chapter two are incredible verses that deal with the mindset of being a part of a team. Now, that's what we covered last time. There are more choices. And I want, us to, I want us to pick it up there. But before I show you more ways to choose joy, I want to show you a way that you don't need to do, well, a choice that you don't need to make. There's a wrong way to build joy in your life, and there's a right way. Watch this. This is the wrong way. Are you tired of putting on a fake smile when you're having a bad day so that everyone will think you're a great Christian? What if there was a way you could make the world think you were a joyful Christian even on your worst days? Now there is. Introducing The Christian Smile, the first realistic, easy-to-use smile alternative for Christians. 
The Christian smile allows Christians to hide their true feelings behind a beautiful artificial smile that will make others think they are happy and content. With the Christian smile, you'll never be bothered by people offering to help you or pray for you, so you can face your personal challenges alone. If you order now, you'll also receive a free pair of Christian eyes, guaranteed to cover your tears and make you look cheery and optimistic. So order the Christian smile, the smile that says to the world, I'm Christian and I'm smiling. Not recommended for those that value reality and honesty, may scare children and animals. That is not the way to choose joy. Wouldn't you agree? Don't go down that road, but unfortunately, I know that's kind of an exaggerated way, but a lot of us do that. We put on these masks and we pretend to be joyful because we don't want anybody to think we're not. But listen, God wants you to be transparent. He wants you to be real. He can deal with the reality of your depression. He can deal with the reality of your grief. He can deal with the reality of your just feeling glub. I mean, God, he can handle that. He wants you to be honest there. And you know what? God's people can put up with it too and help. They can, they're more willing to come alongside of you when you're hurting and help. It's just when we try to pretend to be something we're not, we're missing out on this joy that could be ours. Now, let's, let's move on to the fifth way to choose joy, and that is or to look for ways to serve others and don't wait until you think they deserve it. Look for ways to serve others and don't wait until you think they deserve it. Look at verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2. Verse 17 says, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, I'm making a commitment to you, to bless you, to encourage you, even if you never respond to me. Now, you have, but that's beside the point. He says, I'm doing this and I'm choosing to rejoice because I have the opportunity to bless you in that way. He says, now I recommend that you do likewise with me and don't expect anything in return. The problem is I, we have this, this, this expectation in us that says, well, I'm going to do something nice to you. When I do that, you ought to at least say thank you. And if you don't show me appreciation, then why should I ever serve you again? Why should I ever bless you again? And, and God is trying to teach us this lesson. He says the, the joy, if you want to experience the joy that God has, it has everything to do with unconditional love where you love an individual without expecting something in return. It's where you're willing to literally serve somebody else knowing that they won't respond to you with a thank you. That's what he's saying here. Joy has to come with no strings attached. And he says, if you want to experience that kind of joy, it comes from sacrificial living. And that's what Paul's saying. I did that. I sacrificed my life, my wants, my desires, my goals, all those things that I want to do with my life. I've sacrificed all that in order to benefit you, to serve you. That's what he's saying here. Look for ways to serve others. And he didn't wait, to think, to wait until they deserved it. Now, that, number six, make time for old friends. Make time for old friends. Look at verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send you Epaphrodites, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Now stop right there for a minute. Who in the world is this Epaphrodites and why is this in the middle of the letter? Well, what happened was this. Paul was obviously in need of some help where he was. So the people at the church at Philippi decided that they wanted to help Paul. So they, they got Epaphroditus who was wanting to be of help. He says, we're going to send you Epaphroditus along with a huge offering. We, we've taken up an offering to, to help Paul in what he's doing. So I want you to take that and go see Paul and, and spend as much time as you need to be while you're there. Now, they weren't thinking that he would be there forever. This was just kind of, he's a messenger they're sending. But while he was there with Paul, he brought him the, the gift and he began to help him. He got deathly sick to the point of death. They thought he was going to die. And word got back to the folks in Philippi that he was deathly sick. And they were so worried about him and wondering if they'd ever see him again. And that's when Paul said, sent him back with this, with this letter. He says, I'm sending uh, Paphrodites back with this letter just so, so you can see firsthand, since they don't have Skype or uh, FaceTime, they can't see if he's really alive. They sent him back so that they could see that, hey, he really is alive and he was a help to Paul and all that. So that's what's going on here. Well, listen to what he says next. Verse 26, 
because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may do something. Do what? Rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. He was worried for them, and so what's he doing? He sends Epaphroditus back. Now, what's happening here is that Epaphroditus, I mean, this is like a reunion. He's been gone a long time, so he's sending him back knowing that the fact that he's back is going to be reason for joy. What, what's at the heart of this couple of verses? Is there something about reunions with old friends? I mean, there's some people in your life that you used to be really involved with and you used to talk to a lot. Maybe it was before you moved here. And it, there are people that, you know, when you think about your past, they had everything to do with you becoming the kind of person you are. When's the last time you talked to them? When was the last time you picked up the phone and just called them and, and did nothing? You, you weren't there to get something from them or anything like that. You called them and say, I'm just thinking I'm praying for you. What's going on? How are you doing these days? And just catch up. And in the course of that conversation, all of a sudden, you remember things that happened when you were together before, and then you start laughing, or you think, can you, can you believe it when we did this or we went there? You remember, that? You remember when this happened? You're just, just talking like that. God is saying in his word here that when you have those kinds of reunions, you are providing a platform for joy. You're choosing to experience joy. So what do you do here? Well, who are you going to call? Who are you going to text? Who are you going to send a message to? Who are, you going to, who are you going to contact? Jot that name down right now, right there on your sheet. Jot the name so you don't forget it. But you need to make a decision. If you're looking to experience joy, make some decisions here. Choose joy. Don't sit back and say, well, if he wanted to talk to me, then he'd call me. Yeah, but you're the one that wants joy, right? That brings me to number seven. Treat people like you value them. Don't use them. Treat people like you value them. Look at verse 29. He adds one more comment about Epaphrodites. He says, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. What he's saying is, I want you to treat him like a VIP. I want you to treat him like he's really important or she's really important to you. When you see her, there ought to be the brightness of your eyes when you see him. There ought to be that time where you come and you give them a big old hug. I mean, you, you know, if you're within five feet of me, you're going to get a hug, right? When you walk in the door, if your arm is dangling, just be prepared to have the hand brought over there and I give you a big old hug. Why? Because I want you to know you are important to me. I, I, this is just a physical way to say I value you. And I look at you and I smile at you and I, I say, hey, you're important. You're important to God and a lot of people. You're important to me. And so I, I want to take the initiative to do that. That's really, that. You need to do things like that. Another way is to send cards. You did that to me. I mean, with my 20th anniversary a couple weeks ago, you wrote all these cards, hundreds of cards, and I've been going through them and reading every single one of them and loving it because then you're bringing up memories. It's all, you're, you're bringing, do you remember when and uh, these kind of things happened? You were there for this, and I'm thinking, wow, and it just began to create within me this incredible joy. Then I had a birthday a couple days after that, and I got more cards. Uh, my job description is now spend weeks to read cards. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. But you know what you're doing? You were just treating me like you valued me when you did that. And it created within me amazing joy. Thank you. That's part of it. You chose joy, mostly for me. And when you choose joy, you're not necessarily just choosing it for yourself. You're choosing for joy to be that which is unleashed and touch the people that you're dealing with. This is all about treating people like you value them. Then, number eight, choose joy by reminding yourself that the Lord Jesus never changes. Choose joy by remembering that Jesus never changes. Verse one of chapter three of Philippians, he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Not rejoice in your circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord. And if you go down one chapter to chapter 4, verse 4, he says basically the same thing again. He says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So what's he saying is? He's saying remember who it is that births the joy within you. Remember you're releasing him, not asking him to produce something separate. It's all about him. 
So God says, listen, I, I want to do this. I want to release this joy. So give me a chance. It's all about me. Focus on me. Some of the things, when I'm under the gun and I've got pressure and, I, you know, I don't always have feelings of joy. But if I'm wanting to kind of come back, I don't want to be run and, and governed by my feelings of unjoy. I'm always going to go back and think about the past, things that God has done. Since God never changes, I, don't want, I want him to be the same today working in my life as he did way back then. And way back there, sometimes it seems to be much more clear because I've highlighted one particular moment, like the time when I trusted Christ as my Savior. I, I can remember it vividly. And I remember what he did. And I remember what my life was like the first week afterward. It was incredibly different than it had been the week before because of the handiwork of God. And so I think back to that, and I think, wow, if he made that kind of dramatic difference in my life then, he can do the same thing now because God never changes. And, and when I think about that, then I realize, well, then my circumstances aren't the ones that determine the outcome of this event. It's the God who was there then is the God who's here now, and he will determine the end as long as I release him. As I allow him to live his life the way he wants to in and through me. Again, we're talking about the vine and the branches. We're attached that way. I've just got to let him bear that fruit through me that he's been wanting to all along. It's all about him. Rem remind yourself that Jesus never changes. Never. Therefore, the one who treated you with kindness way back then is the same God now. He will not forget you. Now, that brings me to number nine. Lead people to Jesus. You want incredible joy? Lead people to Jesus. Listen to what he says in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. He's calling the people of Philippi his joy and his crown. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul uses the same terminology in a different way that helps you visualize what he's talking about here. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19 says, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? It's not what, but who is. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Here's the image. One of these days, Jesus is coming back. And when he does, it will create within you incredible joy. But you need to know that one of the things that's going to be added to this joy that you experience would be other objects of joy and the crowns. And those are people that you've led to Christ. Those are people that you've helped along the journey, their spiritual journey. And they create great joy because you're able, you're able to watch them grow and develop. And you're, and you're, you're experiencing the joy for them. But Whenever you talk to somebody about Jesus and introduce them to Jesus and they open their heart and invite Christ into their life, oh my goodness, to be there, it's like being there for the birth of a baby. It's exciting. You, you don't know what's going to happen next and you watch it and bam, it happens. And I've had the privilege of being around a lot of people like that, but so have some of you. You've been there and, and there's no greater joy. The moment you, you actually ask a person, would you like to receive Christ right now? And they say yes. Everything inside of you says, wow, this is incredible. They're ready. And then you say, well, here, here's how you do that. And they receive Christ and everything changes. Incredible joy. Every time I see those people that I've been personally involved in their change, I, I'm reminded of that and it excites me. And that's what Paul is saying here. I get so excited when I think of all you folks in Philippi because he's the one that went there and started that church. He went down to the river outside of Philippi and, and met Lydia, and he, he was there in the jail where the jailer, and there was the earthquake, and the jailer was about to kill himself, and Paul says, don't, we're all still here. He led that jailer and his family to Christ, and there were others. I mean, he personally was there. He's so excited, so that's what he's saying. When I think of you and the time when I was able to introduce you to Jesus, you're my crown, my joy. If you lead people to Jesus, I promise you, you will not experience a greater joy. You won't. Now that brings me to number 10. Choose to be a generous person. Choose to be generous. And Paul, he highlights this and he says a lot about it. But let me just read verse 10 to you. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity 
And that's when they sent Epaphrodites. What he's saying is, what blessed me was knowing that the moment you had an opportunity to help me, you did. You were generous. Your generosity blessed me. But it also blessed the folks in Philippi. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't afford it either, but they did it anyway. And they sent it, and out of their little, they gave as much as they could, and it created in them this joy where they express, and it's expressed throughout the letter of Philippians, because you see Paul, he's saying, you responded to me in this way, because now you had the opportunity. Generosity is always key. When you want joy, you've got to be generous. When you're stingy, you're not going to experience joy. Joy is a byproduct of generosity, and that's what he's talking about. We could go into more details there, but I want to move on down. Number 11, number 11 is is not from the book of Philippians. I added this because there was one part of choosing joy that I thought I needed to make sure you heard. Number 11, you want to choose joy? Spend time in God's Word. Spend time in God's Word. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Sometimes we just don't even have the capacity to understand joy because we're men and women of flesh. And and our experiences aren't broad enough and we just don't understand the ways of God. And what he's saying here is this. You need to so flood your mind and your heart with my word so that you have some kind of foundation platform by which to understand joy. When you understand what I'm like based upon my word, when you understand what I do based upon my word, when you understand what my desires are for you based upon my word, then you know what to expect. You know what to ask for. So when it comes to joy, you want to experience joy in the midst of your horrible circumstances, then it boils back to who God is again. And what do we know about God? What he has revealed of himself. If what you know about God is simply what you've just surmised and speculated and, and theorized, then you, you need to know you're on risk, you're d- treading water, and it's very risky that you'll probably drown. Because God knows that if you just come up with a God that you want to be, it's not going to be enough. God says, I have revealed myself in my word so you don't have to guess what I'm like. So that's why you have to be in God's word. You need to spend time daily reading the scriptures. Much of it you're going to read and you're not going to get. There's still parts of the scripture when I'm reading them, I'm saying, what does that mean? What is the purpose of that? Why is that? Th- why did you do that, God? But then the next time I read it, it tends to make a little bit more sense. And then the next time, and so on and so on. And I, I've kept journals and logs of some of my quiet times and my devotional times for years since I've become a Christian. And I look back there and I say, wow, I didn't get it there, but now I get that here. Oh, I got it back then, but I've forgotten it since that time. I need to redo it over here. And so it just, it's the way we grow, by getting into God's Word. You make the, the balance of your life God's Word, not your wishes and wants. That's what we do with joy. We swap joy for happiness. And then when our circumstances change our happiness into gloom and doom and depression, we wonder, where's God? Well, we, we got rid of God a long time ago when we swapped happiness for joy. Remember, joy is really God revealing himself. Happiness just happens to be a feeling you have when you see God revealing himself. So when you want to come back to is what the scripture says about God revealing himself. Now, those, that's, there's many more throughout, throughout the scripture. There are other ways to choose joy. But I want to tie all this together and wrap it all up together by answering one more question. Why do we need joy? Why do we need joy? Four reasons to choose joy. And, and you need to keep the keys in mind, open up the door, but then you come here. Number one, the first reason you need to choose joy is this. Joy prevents you from giving up too soon. Joy prevents you from giving up too soon. All of us are tempted to give up. Listen to what the Bible says, James 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy. In other words, he's saying, I want you to have a party. Host a party. That's what he's talking about there. Consider it all joy. Host a party, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. The word trial could be temptations, it could be troubles, it could be tribulation. Any of those are all words based on that one Greek word there. So he's saying, I, what I want you to do is I want you to consider it joy when you're experiencing the worst days of your life. How is that possible? Well, finish. Verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We need to constantly remind ourselves of Philippians 1, verse 6, that says we are a work under construction. God started something that he's going to finish. And along the way, when he's chiseling away, it hurts. When he's sanding you down, it hurts. Painful experiences of life. But understand that God is at work to refine you and turn you more like his son. The reason you can rejoice or choose to, joy, to be joyful when you're experiencing terrible times is because you know that God's up to something. And when you know that God's up to something, you know that it's not going to always be this way. This is a temporary refining time. So that's why we need to rejoice. It's a, it's a way of reminding you so you don't give up before God's finished. Then it really gets bad. Number two, the second reason, joy invites healing. Joy invites healing. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good what? Medicine. I mean, there's something about laughter that changes us. I mean, some of you take yourself too seriously. Sometimes you just need to laugh. You, you realize God has a sense of humor, right? I mean, think of the, the different shapes and sizes and the, the way faces look. I mean, they're all so different. God came up with that. And you know what? Some of them are funny. Look yourself in the mirror. Give yourself permission to laugh. You can. It's all right. But, but when you begin to laugh like that, then you start asking a much deeper question. God, what are you up to here? What are you trying to say? And God says, I made you uniquely just for me. I've given you unique gifts and abilities just for me. Because what I'm about, I want you to be a part of. And you need to look that way. You need to act that way. You need to have these experiences and thoughts so you can join me here. He says, no problem. But I want you sometimes along the journey, <laughs> you're going to laugh because some things about life are funny. I mean, I, uh, periodically I'll go online and pull up some of my favorite comedians. You know, Tim Hawkins is one of them. Uh, he's a Christian comedian. He just, he's hilarious. Sings. You would like him, but you're going to find yourself laughing out loud when you hear what he says. That's why sometimes we brought in speakers here who are humorous in the way they make their presentation because it's good, it's healthy for you. In fact, I was just, as I was browsing my, my files, I came across a report from the Mayo Clinic that they had published a number of years ago when it, when it comes to dealing with stress. And they were talking about how one of the things that they tell their patients is to laugh a little bit, give themselves permission to laugh because laughter has short-term and long-term benefits. Here's what they say. They said when it comes to short-term benefits, and when you laugh, it stimulates your organs. Laughter enhances your intake of oxygen-rich rich air, stimulates your heart, lungs, and muscles, and increases the endorphins that are released by your brain. It's a good thing. And, and they also active, activate and relieve your stress response. He says a rollicking laugh fires up and then cools down your stress response, and it can increase your heart rate and blood pressure. The result, a good, relaxed feeling. It can also soothe your mind. It says laughter can also stimulate circulation and aid muscle relaxation, both of which can reduce some of the physical symptoms of stress. This is the Mayo Clinic saying that. And then they say there's some long-term effects, like it will improve your immune system if you laugh some. Negative thoughts manifest into chemical reactions that can affect your body by bringing more stress into your system and decreasing your immunity. In contrast, positive thoughts, which would be the thoughts that are true from the scriptures, positive thoughts can actually release neuropeptides that help fight stress and potentially more serious illnesses. It even goes on to say that sometimes laughter even reduces and lessens pain. It'll make you feel happier when you laugh. Now, the only reason I bring that up is you need to know, it, it, people don't need to be convinced of the, the role of laughter and funny. We just need to give ourselves permission to play jokes every once in a while. I mean, in the, fa in the context of the family, there ought to be laughter there. We ought to encourage it. When, when I come across something funny, I always brought my kids, come over here, you got to see this. You got to hear this. And now I regret it because all my kids have jokes, corny jokes they won't want to tell me. But... But, it, you know, but that's where they are. They just, they, they, they know it's okay. They've been given permission to laugh. Uh, joy invites healing. Number three, joy prevents you from taking what God does for granted. God does not want you to take him for granted, nor what he's done. And joy will prevent that from happening. Listen to what the psalmist said, Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us 
rejoice and be glad in it. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, this is not yesterday, this is today. Live. Don't just simply endure today as another yesterday. Today is today. You will never have another today like today. So you need to live it, not endure it. Now I want you to look at your neighbor right now and say, live today, don't endure it. Go on. Live today, don't endure it. You got it? All right, tell the person behind you. They didn't hear. Live today, don't endure it. Live today, don't endure it. See, as all you, you know, some of you, when you woke up this morning and the alarm went off or it didn't look on you, go, oh no, I got to get out of bed. God says, you're enduring it. Today is the most amazing day as far as God's concerned. This is the day that he created for you to live. So how are you going to do on this day? Are you going to simply endure and do what you've always done? Or are you going to turn that knob and, and live? and choose joy. I've given you a number, 11 different ways to choose joy. Take one of them. Choose joy in one of those areas today, and that transforms an endured today into a living today. That's what he's saying here. This is the day the Lord's made. Let's rejoice and be glad. And, and finally, joy, number four, empowers you to connect others to Jesus. It always brings us back to the main purpose of God. Listen to this. Psalm 51 is a psalm of King David repenting of his sin. He was guilty of horrible sin, and he came to God, and he repented, and he turned, and he pled for forgiveness, and he asked God to please give him a second chance and restore his life. So in the context of Psalm 51, that's what this, this passage is about. Listen to what he says. Psalm 51, verse 12. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. So that says a couple things. He's not joyful, and nor should he be in light of all that he's done. He's excluded God from what he had just done, and he experienced the consequences of that, and that's called sin. So he's saying, restore to me the joy of your salvation, not my salvation, because it wasn't mine to give. It was his. And then the very next verse or almost the next verse. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Isn't that interesting? He says, when you make the turn and choose joy, it's so that you can bring others with you. That's what he's saying. As bad a thing as that what happened to David, King David, committing adultery and murdering a man, the woman's husband, just so that he wouldn't be caught, and, and lying to the prophet, and all of those things. God, God says, okay, I, I'm, I want you to confess and repent. And he's saying, okay, I'm confessing. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against them. I'm guilty. Please forgive me. And he says, and so God, would you restore? Give me that second chance because when I get the second chance, then I'm going to be about taking people who are disconnected and connecting them to Jesus. That's it. That's what it always boils down to. It's not just simply so you feel better. God's forgiveness is meant to cleanse you of unrighteousness and free you, mobilize you to reach people for Christ. Because they're never going to know how to connect unless you talk to them. Now, with that in mind, let me ask a couple questions. And don't raise your hand. But have you already taken a moment of your life and admitted to God that you are a sinner, that you need somebody to come and forgive you and cleanse you and change you and invited him to come into your life? Have you done that? If you have, then you need to know God always keeps his word. The moment you invited him to come into your life, he invaded and took up residency and said, I forgive you. You are now righteous in the eyes of God. I've made you right because of what I did on the cross. He says, You've, I've come in and I'm going to reside there. Now I want you for the rest of your life to learn how to release me here so that I can live through you. And most of the New Testament, especially the book of Romans, is all about you and I learning how to let the Spirit of God live through us. Not us living a life for God, but literally letting God live his life through us. 
That's what creates joy and peace and patience and all the rest of that. So, that, so have you ever come to that point in your life where you've invited him in? If you've not done that, you need to do that now. Because choosing joy will not work for you unless you do. Because remember, it's all about him. If you've not invited him in, he's not there. So you're crying on, out to God for something that doesn't exist. You need to cry out to God for God as he's revealed himself through Jesus. Invite him to come in. Then what happens is it creates joy.